Ski. This is Snowmobile Wealth Advisors. I'm with Russell and Chris. Today, we're going to be talking about on the economy, all things that's happening out there. Uh, we're going to talk about capital gains and getting taxed on unrealized capital gains for the billionaires, not us, but the billionaires. But here's why it's important to you. Pay attention because it's coming down the pipe at some point if it gets approved for the billionaires. Let's get into it. All right, so before we get started, um, let me just mention that this broadcast is for educational purposes only, right? Uh, so what that means is we don't know who's watching, therefore we don't know and can't you can't construe this as advice because how could it be advice? Um, secondly, uh, please subscribe, consider subscribing, uh, stay up to date on the latest with On The Markets as we dive into it. Uh, we're kind of trying out some new formats, so sorry for the herky-jerky, but uh, we'll dive into it. So, Chris, what are you seeing out there? What's top of your mind on the markets today? Well, I think the biggest debate continues to be inflation, right? And are we going to see more of it? Are we in hyperinflation now? Um, and along with that, I would say there's a possible kind of shifting in the markets. You know, um, we've seen some some headwinds for the big tech stocks and uh and, and while we're seeing that, we're seeing a rotation to other areas of the market that have done really well, uh, both recently and over the last year. So I, th I think that, you know, if there's one thing to know about investing is that things are always changing and you've got to be ready. Uh, what's worked in the past isn't always going to work in the future. Right. And so, um, you know, being being ready for anything is important. That's right. What about you, Russell? What are you seeing out there? You know, just doing a little bit more of that inflation, uh, we're seeing rent prices go up quite considerably, much more than people were expecting. And I promised I'd give you pre some entertaining updates on trucking. Uh, here's a fun fact. Let's say you're a trucker and with this massive shortage in s moving the product off of ships, you're sitting at port. Should you get paid for it? Hmm. Hmm. Good question. What I would you do? If you so. don't, I don't think they get paid. What do you think? They don't get paid. But well, they got to be pretty teed off at this point. They're extremely teed off, and they've actually attempted to do a couple of different strikes. They haven't really been able to pull that off. Uh, but that is a slowdown in the economy. That's going to really frustrate a lot of that. Though I know you pulled up one of those interesting uh, Twitter slides. Chris, I'm glad you pulled that in. We'll get into what they're doing with shipping containers. That was Actually, a really yeah. cool experience. Does it feel good? I believe feel President Biden's moment. actually using an executive order to try to solve this issue, right? Yeah, twenty-four hour opening <laughs> of all ports. What a! Can, can you imagine the people that live near the like the Long Beach port? They're just getting bombarded with constant noise. But I guess they chose to move there, so uh, maybe. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll strike that comment because there's a lot of sociological yeah. factors there. Yeah. So, Chris, what are we doing on this cartoon here, bud? Uh, I just I, <laughs> I just thought it was kind of funny. Uh, you know, in the social media world that we all live in, I think we can all relate to to this scenario uh, sometimes multiple times a day. So I, I just thought I saw this from Eddie Effelbein and uh, I just thought it was hilarious. So uh, we try we try to uh, be as calm and collected as we can and as transparent as possible, which is why I hope you're hungry, Darren, because I think we're going to eat a little crow uh, at the moment here. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So this I, I just is... had that wonderful blackened salmon kale salad from Hot Monk while I was yes. racing to get back here. Yeah. So why are we, how are we going to eat crow? Oh, because of so, Tesla? What you're looking at here now, Tesla is up. I think it was up again today. I haven't really. You had get three fourths of the crow, though, Chris. On this, yes, I get, oh, I get a quarter. Most <laughs> of the crow is, most of the crow is coming right here. This is Tesla, December twenty first to today to yesterday, um, or maybe Friday. I think it was ten twenty two, and you know back when Tesla was being added to the S and P five hundred on December twenty first of last year. We said, hey, historically, when companies have been added to the S&P, they've underperformed. 
Um, that's been historic. But I think we also said, I'm pretty sure, and I, I think anytime we've talked, to te- talked about Tesla with a client, we've said, take it with the fact that we've always been wrong about Tesla. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, so take our advice with what you will, right? Um, well, we weren't completely wrong because we did pretty much call the top when it was included in the index. It's just it didn't end yeah. up like some of the other stocks that get included in the index where they never go back above that spot. You yeah, know, the, so. the interesting thing about Tesla, Chris, and I'm right there with you, you know, as a fundamental analysis, it makes no sense. But then you have to realize people aren't buying Tesla for Tesla's fundamentals. They're buying Tesla for Elon Musk. He is the company. And uh, I just had a client today because, you know, Russell, I made a good call on that Tesla. And I go, you sure did. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I'm happy for everybody that did. Uh, you know, it struggled most of the year until recently. And then the big news this week was that Hertz is going to buy what is 100,000 Teslas is what they announced. Um, and so Tesla was up something like 12% yesterday, I believe. Uh, it was up again today. Major, major call option. I, I think I read a stat that it was it was 50% of the options market. Uh, yesterday, options market. Tesla volume. or Hertz? Tesla. I thought uh, Hertz was dead, and then all of a sudden they're <laughs> going to start using Tesla cars. Right. So, so anyway, uh, you know, we just we 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 want to show we want to show even when we're wrong here um, on this show, and uh, this is one that so far has has done better. So that orange line is the S and P five hundred. So what you're looking at is. Tesla versus just if you were to invest in the index, total return, so dividends reinvested um, on that time period, December 21st. It'll be interesting if we remember to visit this in December just to see exactly one year where it is. Um, and then maybe look in longer term, three, five years, which is really where investors should be looking anyway um, when they're making decisions like this. I will say, though, when you have a stock move, this fast, this quick, what do we know about that from a principal standpoint? Typically when it moves really quick like that, it snaps back quick. So it wouldn't be yeah. shocking to see this move up really quickly and then a snap back down. The um, RSI maybe not as far, but you know. Extremely overbought, extremely overbought. And a lot of that's due to that option volume, the dealers having to, to buy to cover the calls that, that are being put in the market right now. So, um, I agree with you, Darren, most of the time, but like, like we said already, Tesla is a different animal and pretty much always wrong on it. So I'm not even, (laughs) it kind of looks like the Bitcoin chart, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Well, have you read, or I, I skimmed over an article. I don't remember how long ago Tesla planning, or maybe planning on combining all of its company under one roof. Do you recall any of that? possible there's been a lot of stuff that's been announced that hasn't actually come out yet and now their market cap so they hit a trillion dollars and their market cap they're they're more highly valued by the market than pretty much all the other car companies combined so but let's leave tesla for a second let's go to the other big story this week which is the the supply chain disruptions the the major backups in the port in la everybody knows about it i thought this cartoon was a little bit f- funny from kyla uh, scanlon uh she puts out a lot of good stuff and and she, you know just drawing it out here how it works you know it gets loaded in a container and put onto a boat and then they have to take it on the cranes so there was a the ceo of a company called FlexPoint who was incidentally on a podcast with Odd Lots with uh, Joe Weisenthal and Tracy Galloway. Excellent podcast if you wanna learn, learn more about the supply chain disruptions. He is the CEO of his FlexPoint. They're a global logistics company. And he put this Twitter thread out um, that basically said, hey, we rented a boat, we went to the LA ports, we went on the inside, so to speak, and to see what the problem was. He's like, there's 100 cranes, only like seven of them are running, uh, basically because there's nowhere to put the containers. The reason why there's nowhere to put the containers is because the empty ones, the trucks are driving around with the empty ones on their chassis and the trucks had nowhere to drop them. 
Uh, there's nowhere to store them, basically, because LA has this weird thing, uh, or, or, or not, not weird, but it's a city ordinance, something that they can't stack the containers more than one high. So there was nowhere to stack all these empty containers. So anyway, he puts in the Twitter thread, hey, mayor, you know, one of the ideas that I would have to fix this major problem is to do a temporary authorization to let them stack these empty containers higher so that the trucks can go back, get more of the containers, unload, come back, et cetera, et cetera. Lo and behold, the mayor responded, which I think is the next slide, Darren, if I, if I remember right. Yeah. So um, he responded almost immediately. And this is an awesome story of someone going into the inside, putting the information out to the public, and the politician responded immediately. And hopefully we're going to start to see some relief um, in that pipeline because of the work of this Ryan Peterson. I thought that was an awesome story from this week. And being a Hayek economist, I just love it. It was a free market that took it to the politicians and said, hey, here's the opportunity that we can do. Yay, free markets. It wasn't a government entity looking at it and trying to figure it out. It was the people. Yeah. And also it was awesome because he didn't just like say theoretically this is the problem and not offer any solutions. He went in there and literally saw what the problem was, offered solutions. He also crowdsourced other people. Hey, can are there other things that we could be doing to free this up? Because his basic point was if we don't get this unclogged, it could completely destroy the economy based on all the supply shortage that it's creating. So anyway, enough of that. A good story. Sentiment indicator up a lot uh, this last week. We're, we're back in the fully bullish area uh, within within the markets. Amazing how a little bit of upside and, and people start piling back in, right? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, maybe it's well-founded because uh, this chart shows that November has historically been a very strong month. So this goes back to 1950. Um, so you can see the dark blue is, is what uh, November's returned historically. Uh, over the last 20 years is a little bit lighter blue, so even better. The past 10 years have been amazing for November. And then you've got post-election years uh, in the gray. And so um, all those things combined, um, you know, if you're, if you're looking at probabilities based on seasonality within the markets, typically November has been a strong month to be invested. The Santa Claus rally. That's right. That's if we can get Santa Claus's presents delivered down the chimneys. Yeah, because the boats exactly. don't work. Got to get those containers moved. Hey, this is the tip. This is if there's any tip yet. Well, we don't really give advice on this channel, but if there's a tip that I'll give anybody to save their Christmas is order your presents now because yeah. there isn't going to be a lot in the stores come Christmas time. Nope. I, or just tell your kids they've been too bad this year and it's not happening. Well, just realize, do your Amazon orders. You don't have two-day shipping on your Amazon orders anymore. Yeah. 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 So greed index a little high uh, as well. So that's in alignment uh, on this chart. <clears throat> and then Bitcoin. Wow. A lot of good news coming in the Bitcoin complex this last couple of weeks with the whoa, ETF whoa. approvals. Chris, did you just attach Bitcoin and good news? <laughs> has, has there not been like okay, basically a never a never ending stream of good news for Bitcoin this last couple of weeks? <laughs> That's true. right. And 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 you know, you see the greed's higher now that we're we're at twice the price that we were at back in the summertime when uh, basically there's a lot of fear in the market, you know, people, people thought it was over and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but here's where we are now. New M2 but you'll have to watch on the number. economy on Friday and then I'll go into all on the markets on Friday and I'll go into all that. Yes. So let me, let me quote the statistics here. The new M2 money supply number came out today. And uh, we're at a current level of 20.98 trillion, which is up from 20.80 trillion last month, um, and up from 18.57 trillion one year ago. So this is a change of 0.89% from last month. So it's up almost 1% month over month. 
Uh, it's up 13% from one year ago. Um, and we don't have the numbers in here, but I was looking at it earlier. On a three-year basis, it's up something like 47%. <laughs> so a lot, of, a lot of good money coming into the system, which leads us to this meme, right? So high valuations can be both justified and indicative of lower future returns. So basics of investing, you know, you make your money on, on the buy, right? And when you're paying a high price for something, it's harder to get a high return. And, um, you know, you combine high sentiment with loose monetary policy and we've got high valuations uh, pretty yeah. much across the board. Um, go ahead, Russell. No, I was just looking at um, a chart where it compares where the S&P 500 valuations are compared to different multiples. And it's tracking right in between 22 and 25 percent or 25 times earnings or future earnings. And it's just it's an incredible valuation. But a lot of that is focused on your FANG stocks. So it's mm -hmm. even when you take the FANG, st fang st stocks out, it sits right under 18 times uh, forward earnings. So it's it's incredibly high valuations at this time. Yeah, we're looking at the forward price to earnings ratio. So uh, so now. you're saying that hold on, but Russell, you're saying that connotating that because it's extremely high value that that's not a good thing. The other side of that equation, maybe not, I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, no, keep going. So the other side of the argument is that money supply chart we just showed a few slides back. If you put more money in the system, then all the evaluations naturally float up. So maybe the relative to historical 10 year Schiller numbers right. are not actually accurate anymore, that all PEs are therefore inflated. And this could be a low end of the new PE. And I would agree with that. Absolutely. I mean, with the amount of cash flow that's involved in the system, it's unlike anything that we've seen in the past. So we can't really compare all of what we've had in the past to what we have today. Mm -hmm. Well, so you've got you've got the 10 year average is in the blue, the blue dotted line, and then you've got the five year average. So to your point, what's happened over the last five years is maybe a little bit abnormal. But even considering that, um, basically, we're in the QE era, era since the great financial crisis, mm -hmm. um, which would encompass the last 10 years plus. Um, so, but we're well above those valuations when you look at it on a forward price to earnings ratio. So this is best expectation of earnings for the S&P for the coming year. Um, so we're at a current ratio of 21, which is above the five-year average of 18.3 and the 10-year average of 16.4. But uh, companies have been beating their earnings estimates. So uh, this quarter, let's see, 84% of the S&P companies have beaten their earnings per share estimates uh, for Q3, Q3, which is tied for the third highest percentage since FactSet began tracking this metric back in 2008. So not a super long data series, but you know, companies are beating uh, those estimates that, that have been coming out. So who knows, maybe, maybe they'll do that over the next 12 months as well. So this is from Ryan Dietrich and it's great because it's showing the, the arithmetic mean index, uh, from value line. So basically it's showing sort of like what we look at with RSP on Fridays, the equal weighted, right? So what, what is kind of the average stock, the mean stock uh, doing within the S&P. And according to this chart, um, the average stock peaked months ago and is just now starting to break out. So if you look at your IWMs, if you look at most of the constituents of the S&P 500, et cetera, they've actually you know, been going through a consolidation and a correction for most of the year. Um, but you wouldn't notice it looking at this, the regular S&P 500 index because it's been held up by uh, by the, the concentration of the large cap growth stocks. Um, so this would argue that you're starting to see a little bit more of a, you know, a healthy rotation to the rest of the market from those concentrations in the, in the, in the leaders that we've seen over the last, uh, several years, especially out of COVID. So pop quiz, 
when's the last time an s p 500 one of the big caps in the s p was up 17 over 17 percent in a day mm, good question other than tesla uh, today tesla <laughs> I mean, think that's, about that. That's a that's big cap S and P company trading like a meme stock. Right. <laughs> it's insanity. Yeah. Well, I th I think it's that it's that uh, that options market volume is huge, man. I mean, for yeah. for that to be half of the options volume, the options market is massive. Yeah. That that's just mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing. I noticed uh, today Pelosi still has her position on Tesla. Good. <laughs> Well, look, man, that's paid off. <laughs> Speaking of, did you read the uh, report from the Fed, how they're going to manage those stock trades from now on? Oh, good foreshadowing, Russell. That's oh, are we going to go there? I won't, I won't touch <laughs> it then. <laughs> so another, another major theme this year has been commodities and their outperformance, right? And so this is the S&P versus the commodities, Bloomberg Commodities Index over the last year. And you can see the commodities have, have outpaced the S&P 500 so far uh, this year. And um, from what I, I would say most of the research I've looked at, this is not just a kind of flash in the pan. This is from basically years and years of under investment in this area, whether it's mining, whether it's uh, oil, um, you name it, the, the capital investment just has not gone into commodities and we have a structural shortage, which has been driving the prices uh, in this arena. So is this a regime shift moving forward? I don't know, but so far year over year, uh, it looks like you know commodities have come alive. I don't know how you could argue that if the Green New Deal passes, which they say within a week, the infrastructure bill might pass, and everything they're talking about doing in that bill uh, and the way we extract precious resources and commodities from the grounds and whatnot, like it's so archaic in comparison, it's gonna be really interesting to watch that boom cycle. Um, yeah. Because if you think there's supply shortages in uh, toilet paper, just weight and copper. Yeah. It's yeah. A, lot, a lot harder to pull copper out of the ground than it is to print a bunch more toilet paper, press it. Right, right. So, and according to this from top-down charts, even though we've seen some major uh, performance out of the commodity sector this year, on a longer term basis, it's really, um, you know, it's, it's still been pretty bombed out. And so valuations are still low according to their uh, valuation metric here, this valuation indicator. You can see that we had that peak in, I don't know, roughly 2007 uh, before the, the 2008 crash. That's when everybody was in the commodity sector. There was way, way too much money going in there. All those um, oil companies that, you know, went broke basically and, and devastated a lot of those companies that had made loans to them. Etc. But since then, investors got burned so bad, basically, at the top of that bubble that they haven't put any money back into that sector since then. And now we've got this structural uh, underinvestment um, combined with the fact that, you know, could be a huge demand coming down the pike with that infrastructure deal. So this is pretty cool. This is just showing the other times where the Bloomberg Commodity Index um, has outperformed the NASDAQ um, by 9% or more. And uh, not surprising, a lot of it happened during the dot-com bust and leading up to the dot-com bust and also during 2008, uh, the great financial crisis. But um, we really haven't seen it since then. Uh, commodities have gone nowhere uh, for the last decade plus, um, but we're starting to, see, starting to see that trickle in here now. Are you foreshadowing, Chris? We we'll ought to watch to find out. <laughs> so suspenseful, man. <laughs> this is Darren's uh, favorite hour of the week. That is. Yeah. Well, a lot of those commodities are produced in other countries, right? Um, 
you know, the U.S., we, we, we would rather put, you know, heavy restrictions on environmental so that, you know, other countries can go ahead and devastate their environments mining the commodities and we'll just buy it from them, right? I think that seems to be our, our plan, maybe. I don't know if you guys agree with that outlook or not. I'm pretty but. sure that's the plan of every major power since the beginning of capitalism. Yeah, so. basically. I mean, out of sight, out of mind. I don't want to know where those diamonds come from, right? Yeah, and that's right. Diamonds or pharmaceuticals, right? That's the new one that's been popping up. Yeah. So now we've got, so this is, this is the U.S. dollar index in red um, versus the USA versus global um, X equity. So basically, how is the U.S. doing versus the rest of the world when it comes to equity performance? And um, typically, you know, this is why we look so much at the dollar, right? Um, when you get a weaker dollar, typically the, the rest of the world is going to outperform uh, in their equity prices. And that has not been, there's a huge gap right now. Um, typically that gap closes, but uh, for where we are right now, that is, that is not happening at the moment. But if we continue to see more investment in that uh, commodity space, et cetera, could be the wind shifting here. So big announcement this week, Darren. Um, Can I take this one, Chris? Go ahead. Is this is in my heart. This is for this you, is, yes. It was a special moment. So <laughs> you know, this, this, this is a, a, cause you know, we were actually having this conversation with a client, but about Visa, right? Mm -hmm. And these credit card companies are in trouble unless they figure out a way to integrate crypto currencies into the way money moves through the world because you can now set up something called a lightning node and move bitcoin to anyone in the world with very little cost um so there's all kinds of economies and, and businesses being created around that whole idea um but this is big right because master card is now connecting and offering bitcoin crypto services um inside their system uh, this is not unexpected. This is expected. What's great news about this and what I love about it is people who say that Bitcoin is a fad and it's going away. Take a company like MasterCard. Do you really think all the politicians are going to go out of their way to make MasterCard's life hard or any of the other companies that are integrating this technology? No, no. way. No. Or that MasterCard is going to take a huge risk and incorporate all this just for the government to say, oh, sorry, you can't use that. I mean, no. that would be a huge pie on the face, right? Well, we, you follow all of the lobbyist dollars. It's going to stay there. It's it's in the system now, which is fantastic for anti-federal reserves like myself. <laughs> yeah, you you libertarians are doing like a victory lap. We're enjoying yeah. life with with all the possibilities. Libertarian, but libertarian-ish. Um, libertarian-ish. That's right. Uh, Libertarian curious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this Russell here. Is, this, this is my thing. You, but this well, is I, I, Darren had to have enjoyed a lot of this as well. Now we just need to pass this on to Congress. This is yes. probably some of the strictest rules in a quasi public company that exists. So they can't do individual stocks at all. They can do uh, mutual fund trades. All trades must be held with, for a year minimum. And they have to give, I can't recall off the top of my head, I'm gonna butcher this, it's either a 35 or 45 day notice before purchase. That is some intense rules. Yeah, I'd love it. <laughs> it Nobody's gonna want this job anymore. They can't be like Congress and completely enrich themselves with it. Now we just need to get this to be in Congress. I don't know why it's not, especially with as much, I guess, Twitter news that it's coming out with the trading that's happening in Congress. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, you always wonder how these politicians enter, enter office and they're making, you know, what is it, 175000 a year or something, and they come out 10, 20 years later and they're worth like $50 million. You're like, <laughs> how did that happen? Well, right? I mean, just think Obama, right? And I'm not saying anything about politics. I'm just saying, look at the facts. Obama was a community organizer before he went into politics. Yeah. That's like pretty much a, the equivalent to a modern day nun taking an oath of poverty. And now him and his wife are multi, multi-millionaires. Right. 
Mm-hmm. And it's both sides of the aisle, you know, don't not have anybody get upset. Uh, there's many, you know, there's many examples on both sides. Yes. The, the two Republican senators lost last year basically because of an insider trading scandal. Scandal. Um, so it it's b- uh, both sides milking it, right? So um, right. China We're issue. We're apolitical here. We like to point fingers in the Fed. Yes. Fed equally. We, right. we, we dislike the parties equally, that's for sure. Um, so an update on the China situation. Um, this is from Bloomberg. The People's Bank of China doubles the gross injection to 200 billion won on Monday. So um, that resulted in a net injection of 190 billion won, the largest since January. So just as we predicted, um, and everybody else that knows anything about markets at all, um, the central bank of China is going to come in and flood the market to keep that uh, company from, keep Evergrande from imploding and and, uh, having issues. So this is the playbook across the the planet. It's not just the U.S. central bank, central banks around the world, any sign of stress, flood the market, bail out the companies in question, um, borrow money to the, to the hilt and, uh, and move on to the next crisis, right? So now for my little uh, plug, we're going to be talking a little bit about that from from the professor next month. We're going to take an example of when a federal government or central bank imbues a ton of money into the system. Yes. Yeah. You mean they actually know what happens when they do that? There's plenty of examples and we're going to take a nice good prime one. (laughs) Yeah. And, And there's there's a lot of people that are way smarter than me that, that understand this stuff. But I would say, um, you know, one of the people that makes the most sense to me is Dr. Lacey Hunt. And his point is that even despite all this, all you're doing is pulling forward growth by borrowing. There's no magic pill. Com- uh, governments have tried this all throughout history where they try to borrow their way into prosperity and it doesn't work. It doesn't create inflation, uh, which is what this chart would would argue. Um, so this is from Colin Roach and he said, um, pretty, pretty simple debunking of the U S dollar inflation narrative. In short, the government printed tons of money during COVID and that caused some uncomfortable inflation in 2021. Uh, but the fiscal headwind in 2022 and 23 is huge. So basically the pulling back of that, all the arguing we're seeing about the infrastructure bill, et cetera. Um, so the deceleration on the other side, um, you know, argues for the fact that this is, this is probably more of a temporary situation um, when it comes to the fiscal uh, adding to inflation. I would also say we looked at the M2 money supply, but what we didn't have updated yet is the velocity. So the, the velocity with which that money goes through the economy is at all time lows. Um, and so that was not, that hasn't been updated since June. So we don't know what the latest numbers are. So even though all that money's getting put in the system, it's not cycling through. Um, and, and that's what you need in order to generate uh, sustainable inflation is more of the cycling of that money. So hey, Chris, Chris, do you remember last week, a couple weeks ago, we had a, a viewer named Justin pulling up in his 30K Toyota Camry? Yes, is he back? Yeah, he's back. He's pulled up in the 30K Toyota Camry. Shout out to you, Justin. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> That's awesome. Just do, doing my best to keep it light, you know, break up <laughs> his monotony of charts. <laughs> So, so cash assets at bank, Chris, all, all that money is going to the banks. It's sitting on their balance sheets at the moment. Yeah. Sorry, Russell. Go I ahead. was going to ask, you said it was reported last in June, the velocity. Yeah. How often is that normally reported? Is it every six months? Uh, well, let's see here. The next update, uh, let's see. I'm sorry. It was, it was last updated October 5th. And so, okay. but the period is measured through June. Sorry. So it is a quarterly number. So the next one will be uh, July, August, September when it's released um, uh, on that uh, velocity number. 
Margin debt coming down, so another area of, of money in the system so, is- Time out, for our viewers, what's margin debt? Because not everybody knows that one. Margin debt is basically the debt that you can take out against your portfolio. So some sort of collateral, and then you borrow against that, and it gives you borrowed money to do things with, invest, etc. cetera. So, so and this you is can take your- year. You can take your million dollars in Tesla and take a margin loan on it and have half a million dollars on to go do something yeah. with. Yeah, you could. And that is <laughs> definitely not advice. <laughs> Just an example. Yeah, yeah. So the the prior times we've been at, at, at year over year gains and margin debt of over 50%. Um, you can see those dots here and you can draw your own conclusions. Um, but last year in 2020, we saw that uh, happen as well, where be basically people weren't satisfied with just spending every dime they had. They also were borrowing money uh, to also put money into the, to the system. And we're coming off of that now. So uh, one of the many charts where it's showing that, hey, there's, a, there's money coming out of the system now. We're kind of at the end of this rainbow of money coming from the sky. Um, in all different directions, this flood, this river of money that's come into the market over the last two years is starting to dry up a bit. Until they pass the infrastructure bill. Until, yes, right. Uh, this was really interesting. So percentage of job postings um, with remote work as an option. And you know, I, I can say speaking for myself and talking to, with others, you know, just anecdotal evidence. Um, I, I think if you're if you have a job that could be done remotely and you require your employee to be at at an office space at a certain period of time and, you know, on the clock in their seat, um, chances are you're going to have a really tough time filling that position. People are people have moved on from that. Um, you know, so we jump from what is that 30% of job postings up to 80%. And it looks like we're kind of sustaining that level now where people are able to, to work from anywhere. Um, which kind of reminds me of the, the article that you sent me, Russell, about, um, about the red and the blue. Uh, you know, the, the, the red, what was it? The red counties were trying to join um, West Virginia. The Maryland, you got Maryland, uh, yeah. three Western counties in Maryland trying to, uh, voicing their desire to join Virginia, West Virginia. Yeah. And, and I think more and more, the more people can work from anywhere, I think you're going to see even more splitting of the country where people are going to say, Hey, this place doesn't line up with my politics, whether it's left or right. And they're just going to go somewhere else to be around other people that think like them because they can, they can work from anywhere now. And unfortunately, I think that's gonna just lead to more splitting of the country, um, you know, and politically, which isn't great, but uh, I think it'll be an interesting byproduct of this situation right here. And, and you know, I've pondered about this remote work for a long time, actually probably for about a year now, trying to break down the different economic theory on this, but imagine how much wealth is going to be transferred from New York and California across the United States because of people being able to work remotely. You know, if you no longer have to pay your Manhattan price for your apartment and you can go live in <sighs> Boise, Idaho, that's the first one that came to my head, you're going to have a much better cost of living, but it's, it's going to transfer a whole lot of wealth all the way across. I think while yes, there is the possibility of greater separation, I think what's going to end up happening or possibility is a more of a melting pot of ideas and a transfer of wealth across the United States. So that's, that's my internal optimist trying to sneak his way in. I like it. I like it, Russell. And I think that I agree with the point of political entrenchment, right? Because that's what we've seen is you'll have people moving to parts of the United States where they feel more inclined and supported in their beliefs. Yeah. So we've been asking ourselves, where are all the workers, right? Um, and so this, this chart came out and um, 
according to this at least, um, and this is probably looking in the rear view, but 4 million people were sick with COVID symptoms or caring for someone who was. Um, 5 million people were caring for kids not in school or daycare. And Darren, you and I have talked about this where it's like the school says, hey, you've got an exposure, your kids need to stay home. And it's like, oh, okay, well, hopefully you have something set up, right, that you can do that. Uh, so 5 million were, were taking care of kids. Um, and then another 3 million say they were worried about COVID. So if we're kind of rounding the corner on COVID, maybe we'll see more uh, people coming back to the workforce um, and, and cut down on some of this labor supply uh, shortage that we've seen. And, and heading on to inflation with just that specific thing, you've got the labor force demanding much larger wages and that's starting to create inflation for the things that the goods and services that we're desiring the increased cost of labor is starting to hit the inflation table now so uh, the next inflation numbers are going to probably be very interesting yeah absolutely so on the next chart we see jp morgan a chart put together uh from jp morgan combined with the census and the bureau of labor statistics and their guesstimate is that 35% um, of people had a financial cushion with unemployment benefits, stimulus, savings. And I've seen numbers that approximate that to be about two and a half months worth uh, for most folks. So that would put us kind of towards the end of the year if someone's like, you know what, I don't want to work. I'm just going to live off my savings that I've piled up. It's right around in that that neighborhood. So you would think that we would start to see people coming back to work after the first of the year. Uh, in that category specifically, 20% were early retirees. Um, we've, we've anecdotally seen a lot of that, people that are just shy of retirement time. They're just like, you know what, I'm gonna hang it up and go do something else um, because I just don't like my job and I don't wanna go back and they're forcing me to go back to the office and I don't like Joe Schmo that sits next to me and so I'm not going back. 10% uh, immigration and visa issues, and then 10% a rise in self-employment, which is really interesting and hopeful because maybe we'll see uh, a lot of new companies come out of this distress um, that will be solving problems moving forward and, uh, and be an increase in productivity as well. So initial claims for unemployment insurance, again, under 300,000, uh, a good sign. We're getting close to that normal normal number still a little bit elevated but another number under 300 will take it and i think it's interesting to note the slowdown we're seeing in the housing market so this is from lizanne saunders and it shows the the difference year over year change in sales for a million plus which is in the blue so that's still elevated for homes that's selling for over a million uh, but the houses that are in the 250 to 500 range really are trailing back down to kind of normal levels. So I think we've seen the glut kind of work its way out of that particular market. And now we're just uh, working off of the, the larger markets. And so this is from um, um, the Calculated Risk blog, um, Bill, I'm, I'm spacing on his name right at the moment, um, but he does great work. And so he was saying that the um, National Association of Realtors numbers um, usually lead the case Schiller index. So the year over year number for the National Association of Realtors median price is in the blue. And the red line is the case Schiller home index, a really widely tracked uh, uh, index for prices of, of homes across the, the US. Housing starts, that number just came out again this week. Back to trend, you know, this is, uh, uh, I think this is the 10 year trend. You can see we had a really wild fluctuation there with COVID and it seems like we're back to normal now. And same with the housing market index from the NAHB and Wells Fargo, um, kind of getting back to normal. Drop off in industrial, US industrial production, um, fairly significant. I don't know that it's, it may still be just kind of working out the jitters from COVID. From what I understand, uh, this number is more attached to, you know, how can you produce if you can't get certain parts and supplies to produce? So this yeah. is a supply chain issue from my understanding, which yeah. is probably the largest 
headwind the economy overall is facing yeah. at the moment. That that was a that was a month over month number, so it's it's very noisy. It moves around a lot. Um, this from Lawrence Hamtill showing that the energy sector drawdown that we saw. So energy, backing up for a second, energy has been the top performer in in the U.S. markets at least uh, over the last year. It just absolutely crushed everything else. And part of the reason for that could be that it's coming off its largest drawdown since get this since the Great Depression. The last time we saw that drawdown in the energy market was the Great Depression. So absolute destruction uh, during COVID. We're coming off of that now. So um, a, a lot of a room to run possibly there. So I know there's kind of a lot going on on this chart, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this is looking at the relationship between consumer price index, which is inflation, basically the 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 official inflation numbers CPI. Plus, when you look at high price to earnings ratio, so high valuations or low valuations, so that that combines to look at what's called the real yield. So if the S and P is paying you a certain earnings, okay, you take that earnings and you deduct out inflation because that's basically just inflation of your money so you didn't gain any buying power um, that's your real yield and um, we're at a low point in real yields uh, in the s p and uh, the other times we've been at this this low uh, have not been great times <laughs> as you can see here um, world war ii the panics dot-com bubbles etc treasury rate took off uh, over the last couple of weeks. So this is from September 22nd. Um, let me just look at the notes here. Um, this is December, uh, September 22nd until Friday. So it's just a little bit out of date, um, but it's something like a 24% climb in the treasury rate in basically a month. So uh, we went from something like 117 up to 166 on the 10 year in a, in a span of a month. And during that time period, these are the sectors that in their performance. So if you are an investor that believes that rates are going to continue to go up because of inflation, because of growth, et cetera, um, then maybe these are sectors that you might want to look at for further research because they performed extremely well in a rising rate environment. And I think what's interesting to note here is that you don't see tech at the top of this list. Um, it's kind of more in the middle. If anything, it's it doesn't perform as well in a higher rate environment. And I think uh, this might be our last slide tonight, which is the yield curve. Just revisiting this, um, we're at one eighteen, so we continue to see that spread whiten out as rates continue to move up. So, some combination of of economic growth and inflation. Whatever whatever your explanation is, the rates are moving up. The spreads are moving out. And um, that's typically been a been a good sign. Well, any parting thoughts and wisdom, boys? Great job, Chris. You did this under fifty minutes. Thanks, Forty-eight Russell. minutes, fourteen seconds. Nice. Goes a lot faster when I'm not interrupting you constantly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate each of you. Thanks for joining us for tonight on on the markets. We'll be back on Friday to talk all about the charts. Um, we're probably not going to film until Saturday this week on the markets just because we'll be, uh, um, I'll be in transit. So um, we'll catch up with you during the week. Have a wonderful rest of your week and take care.